in 1835, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote in his book Democracy in America, I think democratic peoples have a natural taste for freedom, but for equality they have a fervent, insatiable, eternal and invincible passion. The struggle for equality and against discrimination has been long and painstaking. Norberto Bobbio reminds us that the first major achievement came with the French Revolution, which consecrated the principle of equality before the law, abolishing privileged classes or castes. Later on, juridical equality was consecrated, prohibiting slavery. Thirdly, equal rights and the rejection of arbitrary discrimination were proclaimed. By the mid-19th century, these three achievements, stemming from the liberal wave of thought, came to be seen as formalistic equalities, necessary at most, but not sufficient. Instead, de facto equality was being proposed to be attained through political revolution. By the last quarter of the 20th century, with the end of the Cold War, this idea had lost much of its appeal. Instead, the notion of equality of opportunity began to gain ground. Yet, attractive as this phrase may be, still needs to be endowed with agreed-upon meaning. Some work has been done in this regard, advancing the propositions that a just society must provide all people with the basic tools – education, healthcare, labor protection, social security – for self-sufficiency. Stressing that, at any rate, special measures are required to redress the vulnerability caused by a history of discrimination, and asserting that the whole society benefits by greater equality and diversity. The ideals of the Enlightenment were protected on a global scale with the establishment of the post-1945 World Order, which embraced human rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, without distinction of any kind. Thus, the post-Second World War proclaimed equality as one of its cornerstone principles, together with human dignity, freedom and peace. More so, in 2012, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in its ruling on the case Atala versus Chile, said that since non-discrimination stems from the value of human dignity, it has the status of a jus cohens norm, that is, a peremptory norm of international law that cannot be breached by states unless other such peremptory norm overrules it. According to Canadian scholar Anne Wojewski, equality and non-discrimination are two sides of the same coin. But what is exactly equality? The concept of freedom may be understandable in itself. However, as the Italian philosopher Norberto Bovio has pointed out, when talking about equality, one must clarify equality of what and among or between whom. As to different facets of equality, during the last several decades, a number of thinkers, including John Rawls, Ronald Dworkin, Martha Nussbaum, and Amartya Sen, have referred to equality of basic goods, of resources, of welfare, of opportunities, of human capabilities, etc. Now, equality suggests a certain identity between subjects in comparison with each other whereby if two or more individuals share a specific trait, they can be said to be equal. Those who do not share that trait are treated as others or outsiders. Throughout history, religion, ethnic origin and gender have been the main factors to provide a sense of identity and belonging to a group or community. Therefore, they have also been the principal grounds for arbitrary discrimination, since they mark the divide them, us. Today, they are considered as suspicious categories, meaning that every difference in treatment on those grounds is presumed arbitrary, unless there is a reasonable, objective explanation. Therefore, 
We may say that equality is both a passion of democratic centuries as well as a danger for those who are not considered equal and because of it are excluded or discriminated against. Discrimination is not defined in any of the general instruments on human rights. The Human Rights Committee of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights provided a definition of discrimination in its general comment number 18, as follows. The committee believes that the term discrimination, as used in the covenant, should be understood to imply any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference which is based on any ground such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status, and which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment or exercise by all persons on an equal footing of all rights and freedoms. Therefore, just as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women defines discrimination as a different treatment based on sex, the Human Rights Committee's definition of discrimination also includes sex as one of the illegitimate grounds on which an arbitrary difference can be made. Moreover, two recent Inter-American Conventions signed in 2013 and 2015 prohibit discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation, although they have not yet entered into force. According to Professor Vajewski, equality can be guaranteed in international treaties in a variety of ways. It can be protected as an autonomous right, that is, the right to equality in and of itself. Equality can also be protected for the sake of other rights, as in the equality of freedom or the equality of the right to vote. Secondly, the non-discrimination clause of a given treaty can be restricted or open. It would be restricted if the categories that can be unlawfully discriminated against are only a few, for instance, gender, race, and religion. On the contrary, the clauses shall be open whenever the categories upon which discrimination would be prohibited include a wider concept, such as other status. On the other hand, Professor Vajewski stresses out that a discriminatory intent is not required for a state to be in breach of its international obligations. A discriminatory result suffices. Also worthy of note is the fact that, besides being defined by judicial practice as a just cohesion norm, non-discrimination is also enshrined in human rights treaties as a principle that must be respected if some rights are suspended for reasons of public emergency. Now, in the same general comment 18 mentioned above, the Human Rights Committee has clarified that not every difference of treatment amounts to discrimination. Some differences may be legitimate, as long as they fulfill the following criteria. First, they are reasonable. Second, they are objective. And third, they aim at achieving a legitimate purpose under international law. These criteria had been laid out by the European Court of Human Rights and by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Both courts add a requirement of proportionality between the affected rights or interests and the protected ones each time a difference is being made. Special measures, called in the United States affirmative action, will be dealt with in a future lesson of this course. The term refers to all policies of a limited and temporary nature aimed exclusively at achieving certain de facto equality, say between men and women or among different ethnic groups or followers of different religions, which must cease once their purpose has been fulfilled. As we will see, such policies, also known popularly and inappropriately as positive discrimination, 
continue to provoke much debate, particularly around questions of fairness and effectiveness. Thank you for watching this class. We kindly invite you to watch the next lesson and to visit our website moochile.com.